Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Lost to Time. You're joined by myself, Joshua Mallard, and co-host... Han Hitchin. How do y'all? So it's been a while, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's actually the summer right now, and we're glad to be back with a new episode. Actually, we just literally today got back from having a nice little time at Universal Studios. Yeah, and oh my God, for anyone who's never been in Florida in the summer, it is really, really hot. And if you are like me and are silly and forget to drink water, it is not a great time. So this let this be your message to please drink water, sponsored by Lost to Time. Yes, we are not as used to the Florida heat as we used to be. For those of you who don't know, we're in Pennsylvania, but we're from Florida. But I like to say, once you leave the heat, it's hard to get used to it again. Yeah. And I guess the same with the cold. So maybe when we get back to Pennsylvania and winter comes again. <laughs> we'll be miserable. We'll hate both. Yeah. Any, yeah, any weather that is not between 50 and 70 degrees is miserable. That's just the way it is. Now, on the bright side, we have a cool episode for you lined up today. Um, we're talking about a composer who kind of is an outlier in the lost the time, you know, criteria or selection. For those of you who don't know, we typically like to highlight composers, musicians, artists of any kind who are from minority groups and have been historically slept on, so to speak. People who were doing extremely well during their lifetime had a lot of success, a lot of accolades, but because of their background are not given a fair shot or their legacy is not properly preserved, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And the composer we're going to be talking about today actually is one of, I mean, arguably the most successful composers in the U.S. or was recently one of the most uh, successful composers in the U.S. Um, he was one of the most performed American composers. He has won a countless number of awards, has received, um, what's the word? honorary doctorate degrees from six like major universities. And if that's enough hints for you to guess who it is, then you are going to love this episode. Yes. Before we tell you who this is, we just want to point out why we might highlight someone who's successful. Um, even people who are successful, when composers pass in particular, um, the driving force behind their music goes away. And by that, we mean that many composers are the primary driving force behind their music. And it takes a lot of people being very interested in their work or preserving their legacy, being interested in that to keep their music surviving. So there's a very actually small number of composers who are, you know, frequently celebrated, whose music is constantly in circulation, who are well past their lifetime. That being said, this composer has a lot of great recordings lined up already. So there's a lot being done to preserve their legacy. And we kind of want to just talk about, you know, their work, their life and all that. But anyways, Han, how about you tell them who we're talking about today? Yeah. So drum roll, we are going to be talking about the one, the only George Walker today. Yes. We're talking about George Walker, a black composer, American composer, and a composer of a great chunk of the 20th century and a bit of the early 21st century. So this is a composer who actually passed pretty recently in 2018. And, you know, now the question is there, what's going to be done to keep the music going? What is the status of their legacy in the first place? And, you know, what did they do during their lifetime? And <laughs> spoiler, a lot of amazing stuff. So we're actually going to jump right in and we'll start from the very beginning, as we like to do. That being said, Han, how about you take it away? Absolutely. So in current events, actually, um, this month in 2022 is going to be George Walker's 100th birthday. That's right. On June 27th, 1922, he was born in Washington, D.C. Um, his father was a physician and he emigrated from the U.S. from West Indies. And actually, we should mention on the 17th, of June will be George Walker Day. Yes, um, the first George Walker Day was in 1997, and it was declared by the mayor of Washington, D.C., and it is something that is still celebrated today. And if you want something fun to do on the 17th or the 27th, go celebrate George Walker and listen to some of his music. 
Yes, as long as one person celebrates, it keeps going. Yeah, absolutely. Then he's not totally lost time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so his father, a physician from the West Indies, and many of his other family members were also artists, actually. Yes, this is a trend. I say it all the time. Music that starts in the family can go a long way. And in the case of George Walker, um, his sister was a distinguished educator, pianist, and an organist. Um, his later wife would be a pianist and a musicologist. His son would end up being a violinist and a composer. Another son would be a playwright. Yes, yeah, so definitely lots and lots of art coming from the Walker family. Definitely. And that would actually lead into his very first piano lessons, which were supervised from his mother. And these started at the age of five. So he started very young doing piano lessons. Yeah, talk about getting them started while they're young. Um, his first teacher was named Mary L. Henry, and his second teacher, Lillian Mitchell Allen, was a woman who had earned her doctorate in music education and was his second teacher. Um, he ended up continuing um, early musical education at Howard University, and there he actually gave his first public performance at the age of 14. Yes, yeah, so this was young. He wasn't even in, I mean, he was doing musical training at a university, but we definitely can't say that he was like, you know, an undergraduate student or something. He was still barely in high school, maybe. He went to Dunbar High School, and this was before he even left there. So from the age of 14, doing his first public performance, and that's impressive. Yes, extremely. Now, he was admitted to Oberlin College um, with a scholarship in 1937. So we're progressing our way through the decades a bit. And here he studied piano with David Moyer and organ with Arthur Poister. So that was, you know, one of his earliest um, sort of like academic experiences at a, a university besides his early musical training. Um, so still in the 30s, in 1939, he became the organist for the Graduate School of Theology of Oberlin College. So we can see he's not composing yet. He's doing a lot of piano a lot of organ playing, but you know, that's a, a big part of his career and you'll learn a bit more about that as we continue. Absolutely, and speaking of his college days, he actually graduated from Oberlin at the age of 18 with the highest honors in his conservatory class. And from there, he was admitted to the Curtis Institute of Music to study piano with Rudolf Serkin, chamber music with William Primrose, and then composition with Rosario Scalero, teacher of Samuel Barber. Yeah, so this is actually a whole interesting topic, the idea of like, um, what, like composer, lineage, pedagogy, stuff like that. Yeah. You know, you study with one person, it connects you to another person who might just be a super famous composer. And, you know, I, I've seen some, some of my colleagues, some of my friends do this stuff, tracing their own lineage. I've seen some super interesting projects too. And, you know, people work their way all the way from today, all the way to Beethoven, wow. before Beethoven. Um, so you see in the 20th century, some really cool standouts as far as this. And that's not the end of George Walker connecting to, you know, some bigger names as far as like people to study with. And I think that's already amazing. Um, composers of color, people of color, um, sort of breaking, I guess, these barriers, you know, getting higher education um, and sort of interacting with some of the quote-unquote big names, stuff like that. Absolutely. And speaking of breaking barriers, he's actually the first Black graduate from the Curtis Institute, um, and he graduated with an artist diploma in piano and composition in 1945. Yes. Now, I guess that's like early life. We're not even really at the early career, but this is where it kind of starts. Like, 1945 to about 1959, there's just so much that happens. And he's still technically like a student, like he's still learning, he's still going to school, stuff like that. And this is just where things really take off. And I wish, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm glad I, it's not all there is to it. Um, yeah. We can't really convey to you how much is going on here. But we'll start, you know, at 1945. And how I want to start this is by saying, of course, he's not just a composer. Um, he had a debut recital 
in um, Town Hall, New York. And this was like his first big thing. Um, and what was cool about it was, you know, he got noticed by the New York Times through this performance. He was the first black instrumentalist to perform in Town Hall. So this was really cool. And he was using those piano skills to like literally win, you know, competitions and stuff. So he won the Philadelphia Youth Auditions and played Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto with the Philadelphia Orchestra. This is at a pretty wow. young age. Um, and then he went on to be the first Black instrumentalist to appear with the Philadelphia Orchestra and then to again perform another concerto, the Brahms second piano concerto with the Baltimore Symphony. Um, and this is actually, you know, not even the end of that. He would, he would play the fourth Beethoven concerto um, with Dean Dixon in his orchestra. So this is all, I don't think this is all, I mean, maybe it is all within 1945, just in that year. Maybe, yeah, I'm not totally sure. But I mean, regardless, it's still a lot of music and a lot of performances and just a lot of people able to, you know, hear George Walker playing this wonderful rep. Yes, I mean, we could barely keep up with <laughs> all the achievements to, to read out um, because this is just his piano skills, you know, getting him really further at such a young age. Um, and we haven't even talked about his compositions yet. And his first major works really start in 1946, right after those string of performances. Yeah, so in 1946 is when George Walker actually composed his famed String Quartet Number no. 1. And what makes the string quartet really popular? Well, it's actually the second movement of the work, which is entitled Lyric for Strings. You might have heard of it. Um, and it's actually known for being the most frequently performed orchestral work by an at the time living American composer. Um, and I think that's just absolutely extraordinary when you think about it. I mean, that's the kind of thing we don't really realize until, hey, hold on a second, the most common played piece by a recently deceased American composer is by George Walker. I mean, I think that's really awesome. Yeah, so this is this might be a piece that you've heard, and we'll talk about it later, but I mean, that's not an easy achievement to have something be the most performed, whether you're a living composer or not. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is just in 1946. I would still consider this like in his early period, like he's still getting going on his career. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what does that mean? He's doing a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and then in 1950, George Walker actually became the first black instrumentalist to be signed by um, a major management, the National Concert Artist. So that I mean, that if that's not a display of success where at that point he's already, you know, getting a manager to um, represent him. I mean, that's just really cool. Yeah, I mean, I think it says something when you need management, you know, like you probably have so much going on. We don't have managers. Yeah, uh, no. But, you know, usually if you do, there's a lot going on. You're, you're getting pretty successful. That being said, you know, all of these um, achievements um, are not just to say, oh, look at all this. It's to say this is someone who's very active. Mm -hmm. You know, they were doing a lot of things and they were successful. Um, so to see them celebrated is really a good thing. And they should still be celebrated if we consider their perceived success. You know, this is really documented information on how much they were doing. That should carry forward, ideally. Yes, I completely agree. So just think about that, you know, as you interact with George Walker's music. Um, I guess, you know, let's not take it for granted. Now, from there, in 1954, he gets out of the U.S. and does a huge Europe tour. So he goes to Sweden, Denmark, Holland, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, and England, and also to Stockholm, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Frankfurt. Um, <laughs> there's so many to list. He's going on a huge, huge European tour, and he's playing in these um, countries, playing in these cities. Um, and that's, I mean, amazing, you know? I guess you could say he walked around Europe. Hey. <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> we can we can uh, maybe uh, edit that one out of your, your mind. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. 
Anyways, he's returning to the United States after this huge European tour. And what's he do? He starts teaching at Dillard University in New Orleans for just a year. After that, he goes on and goes back to school. Yes. And where does he go to school and what is he doing? He goes for a doctoral of musical arts at the Eastman School of Music, and he starts his studies there in 1955. Now, the following year, he became the first Black recipient of a doctoral degree from Eastman, as well as an artist diploma in piano. So that's just, I mean, what else is there to say? Yeah, he's still doing great on piano, doing great in composition. So, you know, he's got two things going really well right now from major institutions. I mean, a lot of the schools we've named are really big name schools today and were back then. After all that, he was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship and a John A. Whitney Fellowship in 1957. So this is a big deal. He was the first composer to receive the Whitney Award. And to get a Fulbright is an amazing thing. In fact, I think this is what got him back out to Europe. In 1957, he would go back to Europe and he would go to Paris. And here he would study with someone you all might know. Nadia Boulanger, that's who he studied with for two years in Paris, France. And for those of you who don't recognize that name, she is a teacher of a slew of really, really wonderful composers. We've talked about her a little bit on previous episodes because she's the teacher of so many composers, both really, really well-known ones and ones who are not quite as well-known and who we are going to make sure are not lost to time. Yes, often enough, Composers who leave the U.S. on some sort of fellowship end up studying with, you know, Nadia Boulanger. And in fact, you can find so many composers connected to her in some way. So this is a big thing. Um, we've considered doing an episode on, you know, Nadia Boulanger or Lily Boulanger, mm -hmm. but their status and the respect people give to them is very, you know, high up there. I mean, and deserved. Yeah, deserved. And I mean, they deserve more of it. So I think um, maybe we'll keep that back in, our, in the back of our minds. If you want to see it, you know, leave a comment and let us know. Yes, leave some riots in the comments and we'll definitely get to it. Yes, but in any case, this is a big deal. I mean, he just came out of this doctoral program at Eastman. Then, bam, he's studying with Nadia Boulanger, getting fellowships. Um, and this is really, um, I guess, the part where his career starts taking off even more. He'd go on another European tour in 1959 and play concerts in France, Holland, and Italy. But from the 1960s, things would take a bit of a shift. So once the 60s hit, Walker actually started to teach, and he had a really, really long career of teaching. Um, he taught at several institutions, including Dalcroze School of Music, the Smith College, University of Colorado, Peabody, and University of Delaware. Um, he actually chaired the music department at Rutgers University from 1969 up until 1992 when he retired. Yes, and after his retirement, a lot of amazing things would happen. But before he even retired, he was still doing plenty of recitals and composing many works. His success was really great. And actually, some would say it reached his peak in 1996 when he became the first Black composer to receive the Pulitzer Prize in music. Now, this was for an amazing piece called Lilacs for Voice and Orchestra that was premiered by the Boston Symphony. That being said, it's not his only relationship to the Pulitzer Prize. In 1977, he had a nominee for his piece, Dialogus for Cello and Orchestra, which is another really cool piece. And it was the only finalist in that particular competition. Wow, that's almost 20 years earlier just to be nominated and so close to winning it. I mean, that's just wild. Yeah, so doing really great. Not to mention that George Walker Day was proclaimed, um, you know, a thing in 1997 um, by the mayor of Washington, D.C. So this was really a good thing, and it's still celebrated today. And mm -hmm. that's on June 17th, in case you forgot. Mark your calendars. Uh, yeah, mark your calendars. Um, you might even be celebrating before this comes out. Yeah. That being said, in 1998, um, <laughs> at least my birth year, right? <laughs> yeah, that's your birth year. No, my birth year is the George Walker Day year. Yeah. Um, 
He received the Composer's Award from the Lancaster Symphony and a letter of distinction from the American Music Center. Um, and it says for his contributions to the field of contemporary American music, which is very true. Yeah. That being said, there's a lot of stuff that also happened besides the Pulitzer. Um, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 1999. And in April 2000, he was inducted into the American Classical Music Hall of Fame. So that's really cool. And that was um, in a, a nice ceremony at the Library of Congress. I actually didn't know there was a Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, no, I did not know that that was a thing either. I mean, who knows? Maybe you and I will get in the Hall of Fame one day. <laughs> yeah, maybe we need to um, learn some more <laughs> of what's going on. I'd put you in the Hall of Fame, Josh. Yeah, maybe uh, we can get the podcast in there. Yeah. So just to highlight a few other achievements of his that we haven't already touched on, he has also won two Guggenheim Fellowships, two Rockefeller Fellowships, say that three times fast, and six honorary doctorate degrees from several institutions, including Oberlin College and the Curtis Institute of Music. Yes, his previous school. So, um, you know, that's really cool. I'd take some honorary doctorates. Yes, please. <laughs> if anyone wants to give us honorary doctorates, we'd appreciate it. Now, that being said, we don't just list off achievements and go over bios just because to show you like, oh, look how successful they are. There's a point behind all of this. And that's that often composers who are very successful from minority backgrounds, that success doesn't always translate to, you know, a legacy, something that goes on beyond their life. And sometimes the responsibility for that is, you know, on the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, um, because of a composer or any other artist background, they aren't given a fair shot all the time. That being said, George Walker is a great example of someone who is, you know, really doing amazing things and getting a lot of love for us. So I think that's amazing. And now that you know about George Walker's life a bit, we hope that you can dig some more into his music and enjoy it. And We'll definitely be talking about the music in just a second. But I also wanted to point out, you know, some of where we get this information. You can actually find on George Walker's website. Now, I don't know if this is like his personally maintained website, but you can go to georgewalker.com. And there's a lot of um, detailed biographical information, information on his works. And actually, that's georgetwalker.com. So this is a place where we found a lot of information on him um, that we didn't even find in some academic resources. So we thought that was really cool. And you can go over there and check for some more infos or a catalog of works, discography and links, um, even articles and reviews. So this is really awesome. Um, and we just wanted to point that out. Yes, it's really interesting to see the websites of these composers, of these artists. Um, and we Stan. don't know if it's a personal website, if like he oh, made yes. it himself or anything, but um, it's nice to have something out there. Yes, absolutely. Which also, if you remember, Galina Usvoskaya had a website too. And a documentary. Yeah. So it's really cool to find those things, you know, so you don't have to always be digging through <laughs> stacks. We don't take through library stacks, but not you know. <laughs> enough. We don't do it enough. That's the right. Word. Well, we don't have stacks. We have online databases and all that. We just go through. We could go to stacks. I mean, we could just I mean, not now in Orlando. but. <laughs> Anyways, let's get into the music. You know, we've kept you waiting long enough and there's plenty of pieces we mentioned. Um, we're going to give you two essential pieces that you just have to listen to if you're going to listen to George Walker. And then we want to talk about some of the new things that are coming out, which is really cool. Yes. So we're going to kick this off with his Pulitzer Prize winning piece, Lilacs. Yes. So this is a great place to start when you're listening to George Walker. Um, so this is actually a piece that's for voice and orchestra. It was originally premiered by the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And of course, it's the Pulitzer Prize winning piece from 1996. That being said, this piece was actually written to celebrate the achievements of the black tenor Ronald Hayes, and it's using a poem by poet Walt Whitman, and that poem is called When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. So this actual poem was a reflection on the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. 
a former or a U.S. president. Yeah, and it was um, written in the midst of the national mourning of um, President Lincoln. So it was definitely something that Whitman put a lot of, he used it as his way of grieving as many other um, American artists might have at the time. Um, Another thing to note is that the premier vocalist was Faye Robinson, and there's actually a recording available on YouTube, um, not by the Boston Orchestra, excuse me, but the Arizona State University Orchestra that features Faye Robinson um, in the performance as well. So um, it's a really interesting performance of the piece, and we totally recommend y'all checking it out. Yeah, it's super cool. It's like um, a really unique opportunity to hear that. And actually, the recording is just right on YouTube. We'll point you to it. And we'll talk a little bit about more upcoming recordings for George Walker's music a bit later on. That being said, this text has a pretty long history. Um, You know, composers like Crumb, Roger Sessions, um, Holst, Hindemith, and many other composers have used this text in some way, set it in some way for their music. Yeah. And George Walker's contribution here is definitely really amazing and, you know, obviously stands the test of time. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, what will you find in this piece? Um, the thing I like to say off the bat is George Walker's music has a lot of variety. If you listen to um, this piece and then you listen to lyric for strings, it's going to give you a completely <laughs> different sound. Um mm-hmm. That's not to say, you know, it's completely inaccessible or anything like that. This is a really cool sort of um, fresh orchestration. It sounds like, you know, a fresh modern take on the orchestra. um, But at the same time, the voice is definitely the driving force behind this. Um, So I I think you get a lot of really amazing textural sort of orchestration here. But then it's very narrative driven. So the text is in English. So... You know, if you're an English speaker like us, you could follow the text and you can very much tell that this isn't just like um, the voice sitting on top of orchestra or something like that. It's a very sort of like fluid, involved setting of the the voice and the orchestra is really sort of like imitating the flower, the floral aspects of a lilac. And that's one of the things he was looking at, these sort of decorative flourishes he noted absolutely and yeah it was just to add on top of that i think that the orchestra and the voice are definitely interacting with each other very much and that's something that is really really cool to see with a piece for not just voice and orchestra but any like solo um or featured instrument and a large accompanying ensemble i think that's really awesome to see um another thing about the text is as we mentioned a lot of other composers have use this text. So when you listen to it, it might sound familiar to you. You might recognize it from other pieces. Um, But another thing is that I feel like the orchestration really um, shifts based on the text. And that's kind of what I think Josh also maybe, I don't want to speak for you, Josh, but um, how narrative the orchestration is and how interactive not just the um, instrument and the orchestra are with each other, but how interactive the instruments and the voice are with the text. Yeah, interactivity, you know, it can really help a lot of people get into music that they might not otherwise have, specifically in regard to voice and orchestra. So I think if you like voice and, and classical music at all, you should definitely check this one out. It's a very, like, Um, beautiful piece, but it's also not super long. And another thing is there's four stanzas to the text and the piece as a whole is split into four movements. So each stanza is basically giving you a different flavor, a different approach to setting the text. So like, for example, the second section has like this really cool dark brass writing. The introductory material then becomes accompaniment for the voice to sit on top of. Well, the first movement, I would say, is generally more of this like floral sort of implication. Um, And then also much more lyrical, very melismatic um, and a bit more. I wouldn't say it's like a bit more like sedate or anything, but it's definitely not as uh, rhythmic and aggressive as the second movement and also not as like dark texturally. But there's a lot in this. Um, I, I think I don't want to compare it to other composers and you know, give you the wrong impression or disrespect the music. This is definitely something that 
you should just listen to, you know, I think it's a great place to start. Um, of course, if someone has a Pulitzer Prize winning piece in their catalog, you should probably listen to that one. But I think it pairs very well with Lyric for Strings, which completely contrasts the sound of this piece um, entirely. Oh, absolutely. And I think that they're both on their own really, really nice pieces to listen to um, for very different reasons. But yes, definitely what you said, Josh. I don't think I could say it better. Yes, and just to make sure you know, this was premiered in 1996, the same year it also won the Pulitzer. So it must have been a good year. <laughs> oh, yes, 1996 is great. Now, when we talk about Lyric for Strings, this might be a piece that you very well have heard because Lyric for Strings is one of the most performed pieces. And at the time that George Walker was alive, it was the most performed piece by a living composer. That being said, if you listen to Lilacs and then you listen to Lyric for Strings, or you listen to Lyric for Strings and then Lilacs, they're worlds apart in how they sound. Yeah, especially because of the time difference in which they were composed. Lyric for Strings was actually originally composed um, back earlier in Walker's uh, career, back in the in the 50s, excuse me, while Lilacs was composed in the late 90s. So there's a big time jump there. But when Walker revised it later, um, he took what he wrote back in 1946 in his first string quartet and took the second movement of that and revised it in 1990, expanding it and making it its own piece for string orchestra called Lyric for Strings. And again, this is his most performed piece, his most recognized piece, um, the most performed piece by a living American composer at the time he was alive which is honestly an outstanding achievement in of itself. And I feel like this piece is worthy of that. Yes, this is not an easy feat to accomplish um, for any composer living or not. Um, that being said, what are you getting into? We said that this piece is a very big shift from lilacs, and that's a lot in the aesthetic and the sort of like historical sound you're going to be hearing from this piece. Um, Lilac sounds much more contemporary, more fresh, more modern. This sounds much more like a romantic piece for string orchestra. That's not to say that it sounds completely dated, though. There's a modern kind of edge to the harmony. The piece has this super satisfying buildup, and then you get these like kind of, <laughs> for lack of a better word, like a gnarly sort of string sustain, some bite to the sound. And I think that's really cool. I think that's something that's going to, um, you know, really impress a lot of listeners to have something that's a bit familiar, but also a bit new. I was going to say, y'all can't see it right now, but I'm aggressively nodding. Yeah, so this is uh, definitely one to check out. It's going to sound really different than Lilacs, but I think having that sort of diversity in your output is a big deal, you know? Um, and it's really cool when you can now take sort of a holistic view of what a composer's outlook is like or what their catalog is like and how their view of music, their outlook on music has changed over time. Yeah, especially for a composer who lives such a long life. I mean, as we mentioned, George Walker lived almost to be 100 years old, and this is kind of stemming from towards the beginning of his career to near the end. Yeah, very long life and very successful, um, even to this day. And that's something else that we wanted to talk a bit about. And that's like, not just the legacy today and stuff, but something that is a bit more unusual for composers that we talk about in Lost the Time. And that's that there are currently active recording projects and stuff of George Walker's music, attempts to bring George Walker's music to the forefront and to continue recording pieces that, you know, aren't often performed or that haven't yet I don't know, received a good recording or anything like that. Yeah, like there's a lot of um, push, for lack of a better word, to get new recordings and not just recent recordings, but we mean upcoming ones that are years to come down the line, which is very exciting to see that we're getting new George Walker content um, even past his death. Yes, and one of the projects that we've seen is actually from the National Symphony Orchestra. I think this is really cool. They've set out to record um, George Walker's Sinfonias, so all five of them, and that's a big project. It's it has release dates between now and as late as 2024. 
Um, and actually, one of them, Symphonia 4, will be released in June. That would be late June. Yeah, late June. So past George Walker Day, and I believe right around his birthday is when the first um, recording session is going to come out. So that'll be his fourth Symphonia. Yes, and this one is an interesting one to listen to. So we wanted to tell you a bit about the piece. So maybe right when the CD release happens or whatever, you can go and take a listen. Or by the time you hear this, you could just listen to whatever recording is accessible out there. Mm -hmm. So Han, how about you tell us a bit about the piece? Absolutely, yeah. So Walker's Fourth Symphonia, which is also titled Strands, is it's a pretty short work. It's about 10 minutes, only one movement. And the subtitle Strands is actually in reference to the piece in the way that um, there's sort of this interaction of the melodic and motivic material and how they're kind of used, they're presented not in a way where one instrument is playing a melody or a motive, but how um, it, they're kind of interlaid orchestrationally, so kind of um, into these layers, and it creates these really interesting textures. Um, so the piece, in a way, is very melodic, but also very textural, which is very cool to see. I think that's interesting, because to me, the way I would describe the piece is that well, first off, compared to even lilacs, you get so much more aggression out of this. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I think the reason for that is that there's so much transparency in everything that's going on. The orchestra is really unified in conveying a given idea, like a motif or a melody or whatever. And so you get these one punchier rhythms, a piece that's more rhythmically driven and also something that's less texturally focused. So you get sort of that huge orchestration sound and that antiphonal kind of writing sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I was thinking about this, but that's not to say that this piece is like all aggression and dissonance the whole time. There's a big shift in this piece that will, that will surprise you. Um, of course, this is a spoiler alert, but the second half has an amazing beautiful, this soft, sustained texture with this solo on top, mm -hmm. cello solo, and it's just completely unexpected to me. And then it even goes out of that back into this, this rhythmically driven, ascending sort of thing. So yeah. you have these moments of stasis in amidst all this aggression, aggression that's super, super cool. And he develops it so patiently, in my opinion. Yeah, I think so too. And it's a very wonderfully paced out work. And I feel like it's just a delight to listen to. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is actually that this piece does have some quotes from a couple spirituals, um, them being titled, There's a Bomb in Gilead and Roll Jordan Roll in later in the brass section. So I think that that's interesting. And that's not something that's unique to this piece. Um, that actually happens also in Lilacs, I believe. Yes, in the fourth movement of lilacs there's a spiritual that's quoted there i mean quotation is something i think is in multiple of george walker's works mm -hmm. um that being said um it's very you know nuanced it's not like i, I think it's going to be harder to pick up for many listeners so i think you know it's a bit of an easter egg something you can dig into yeah if you're really really into those specific spirituals you can probably catch it much easier than Joshua and I can. We don't listen to spirituals that often. Yes, and this is actually a pretty recent piece, right? Premiered in 2012. Yeah, so pretty shortly before his death um, in 2018. Yeah, I mean, that's really within the last 10 years. That's really interesting to think about, too. Another thing that's interesting is like, um, you know, this commission's connected to the Pittsburgh Symphony and a few other um, orchestras, but I, I, I see them in Pennsylvania a lot, like in like Philly, in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't the only time. I mean, in his early days, he was doing Philadelphia auditions and stuff. And, yeah. you know, we're over in Pennsylvania now, so this is interesting to us. You know, we've been to Philly a few times now, but we haven't really explored the city. I wonder if there's a lot of performances of, of him there, you know, kind of like a hometown thing. Yeah, well, his hometown's in D.C., so I imagine there might be a bigger kind of presence down there. Maybe there's a whole George Walker Festival in D.C. that we don't know about. That would be so cool. If that's a thing, please let us know. It's only like a three-ish hour drive away from us. We would love to attend that. 
Yeah. And I think that's a great note to sort of, you know, fuel your um, <laughs> listening experience. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting about George Walker in the context of, you know, this show, Lost the Time, is that he's so clearly someone whose legacy is still unfolding. Yes, because his death is so recent. And he just had such a mass of achievements in his life that it's still, we're almost still kind of processing it only four years post his death. Um, and, and many compositions, I think over 90 works. Yeah, and we're still kind of in the process of celebrating and reflecting on his life. And just with so much that has happened during his long life, um, his abundance of success, I mean, we're still kind of processing, going through, and celebrating it all, especially now as we approach his 100th birthday. Yes. And I guess the whole theme of this is that as listeners today, we have a lot of control over, you know, what we listen to, how we access that music and such. So definitely look into George Walker's music and take an active stance in, you know, celebrating it, preserving its legacy, stuff like that, you know. Tell your friends about George Walker. Um, you know, maybe he'll end up being your favorite composer or something like that. But it's definitely true that when composers pass, a lot of the driving force behind their music can fade with it. Something we saw with Julius Eastman is definitely the case where after his passing, um, a lot of his works were very hard to access, like physically hard to access some mm -hmm. of his sheet music, stuff like that. And of course, his manner of sketching was really particular. So these are great examples of like, you know, why we should take um, an active role in preserving music, celebrating music, um, and keeping that in mind that, um, you know, these things can really slip away. Absolutely. Yes. And just keep in mind, I mean, these composers, they're people too. They're artists. They are contributing to the world. They're, this is how they are expressing their voice, expressing any messages they might have, or just sharing art that they just want to put out into the world. And I think that in of itself is something worth celebrating, no matter how much or how little quote unquote success um, that we have, because I think what is determined as success is definitely subjective. Yes, for sure. Now, we'll include links so that you can explore these pieces. But just to recap, we talked about Lilacs, a piece for voice and orchestra by George Walker. We also talked about Lyric for Strings, a piece for strings uh, by George Walker. And then we also talked about George Walker's Sinfonias. And in particular, we told you a bit about Sinfonia number four, Strands. There's a recording of that online as well um, on YouTube that you can find. But keep in mind that the National Symphony Orchestra will be releasing um, all the symphonias, it looks like, in uh, album form or yeah. in CD form. Yeah, every few months, starting in June, there's going to be, um, it looks like a new record of each symphonia, and they're starting with the fourth one. So if you really love the fourth one, then maybe go and check out the first one, because I believe that's the next one that they would be releasing in October. And then... The later ones, they've yet to announce the order, but that they'll be in 23 and 24. Yes, and it's not easy to get orchestras together. Um, and also, it's not likely that, you know, composers even break through into the orchestral space. So if you know orchestras out there that are performing George Walker's music or releasing um, CDs or anything like that of his music, please let us know in the comments. We'd love to spread that around and check that out. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, uh, we're glad to be back. You know, this is a new episode in quite a while um, mm -hmm. after all of the campground festivities. Yep. Um, you know, we're excited to be reapproaching this show. Um, with that said, there's a few ways you can support us. And the most valuable would be please comment and let us know how you like the episodes. Uh, we know this one is a bit of an interesting one because we're traveling <laughs> at the moment. Yes. Um, but we still try our best to give you, you know, quality content. So please leave a comment. Let us know what you like. Let us know who you're listening to. Yes. Let us know who we might not know and who might be lost to time. Yeah, please. Because we would absolutely love to learn about these composers that we may have, that may have slipped under our radar. And we love learning about them and doing the research and making episodes about them. So please let us know. Anyone that you want, we would be happy to take a look. Yes, and this is actually um, another call to those of you who might be more directly connected with these composers. Um, 
you know, a lot of these composers who may have passed recently have um, relatives or children that are alive and actively um, promoting their legacy. So if you're a researcher or if you're someone in that category, please let us know. We'd love to connect with you and potentially, you know, talk about the work of, you know, a composer who might not be uh, fully appreciated or whose music should just be preserved. You know, I think a lot of us <laughs> need our music preserved. Yes. I mean, who's going to say no to the preservation of music? I don't know. Yes. But with that said, please leave a comment, please leave a like and subscribe so that you can stay tuned and see updates on when the next episodes will be. And of course, keep in mind that there's other podcasts going on and to check those out as well. Tell them we sent you. Yes, we those are our friends, too. We love them. So please check out their stuff, too. Yes. With that said, we'll see you on the next episode. This is Joshua Mallard, Lost to Time and co-host Han Hitchin. And yeah, have a great day, whatever time it is for y'all. Hope y'all enjoy. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> signing off and be cool, but yeah, we're signing off and we'll see you next time. Bye.